Forty years old was I when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore to me on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Skipping up to verse 12. Therefore, give me this mountain. This is a mountain that can be taken for God. I was so amazed when at age 20, uh, 40, I, the very first day I was 40, we moved into the promise of God for YWAM in a place called Kona, Hawaii, halfway between uh, Asia and North America, and uh, also a center for all of the islands down through Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. And so as I, the first day I was there, God gave us the promised land. Forty years old was I. And then later on, much later, maybe a few months ago, when, when I just had, was speaking out of this, this particular portion of Scripture, I suddenly realized that was the day God gave us personal claim on something he had been speaking to us for three years. And so I began to see, oh, Wow, I was 40 then. And uh, when, when he told me about a date, and the date is 2020, Christmas Day. We want to give a gift to Jesus. Would you like to give a gift to Jesus? Yeah. Hey, shall we make it a surprise? Oh, we can't do that. But anyway, we can, we can please the Lord. And so you're seeing a countdown clock here. If it's up, yeah, it is. And, and it tells us how much time we've got. We only have four years, and what is it, nine days now? And, and as, yeah, as, as you see what God can do through a people dedicated to the Lord, you can do things way beyond what you could ask or think because with God, not without him, but with God, all things are possible. And so as he guides us through this, he has given us in our, our realm of influence, we have 1,776 languages that don't even have the one verse, John 3:16 in it. They have nothing. How would you like to have that? A Bible that was no, nothing printed for the whole of the Bible, and all you had was a cover. Oh, what would we miss in life? So much. And so we want to go to zero. Now, you don't want your sports team to go to zero, but you want this one to go to zero. Say zero. 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 Oh, Lamar, come on, tell them outside. Zero. zero. That's right. Now, we're in the mood. We, we need to get out there and do that which others will say is impossible. And what you've already heard, the five steps, is really preceded by one major step, and that's the prayer movement. So as you go to inbiblepovertynow.com, you will see there the first thing it asks you, will you become a part of a million people praying to end Bible poverty now? And we can pray that. Now, the... the uh, Professional translators, see, translation is, is the next one after prayer. And translation, the professionals are on their move because in 2000, Roy Peterson, uh, head of Wycliffe at the time, he said it would take 150 years because they had done their research at their present pace of all the translators in the world, it would take 150 years for the start of the last languages on earth to get into the Bible. Well, a group around the table, Billy Graham had called the conference there in Amsterdam, and around table 71 said, no, it's not going to do that. Now let's get together and start praying for each other, and we all ganged up in prayer uh, with Wycliffe. We're meeting with them, uh, and David's been on that uh, team, and, and Mark Anderson from the very beginning, uh, the leaders of 17 of the major mission movements, praying for each other giving to each other financially, and also praying that others would succeed. 
because that's what it takes. It's everyone doing their part. When it comes together, we will see it done. So as a result, 10 years later, Roy Peterson stood up as we were meeting out in Kona, Hawaii, and uh, as we were praying there at the YWAM base, they, I thought you'd think, oh boy, they're all on holiday. No, <laughs> no, we work hard out there. And, and so at the YWAM base, he stood up and he announced, he said, instead of 150 years, we now have had so many gifts from God of innovations on how to move forward faster. I can tell you, we will start our last languages in 2025, 15 years from now. That was 2010. And so everybody cheered, and we were all happy. And then I spoke up. I'm the oldest in the group. I get away with things, and I take advantage. And so I said, Roy, that's not good enough. It's got to be 2020. <laughs> and so everybody laughed, not me. I was serious. And so a little later on, a couple of years later, he said, it's speeding up, Lauren. I think we're going to get your date. Well, Bob Creason, who is now the head of that, while Roy has moved to the head of American Bible Society, he, Roy, uh, uh, Bob, he said, wow, we're going to make it, 2020. And I heard him tell somebody else, next time I'll listen to Lauren. <laughs> well, it's not me. It's something that God put on my heart, that there's a change element coming and that God is moving, and he is getting some of the kings of the business world to do things, and they, they may not know the Lord at all, but Mr. Musk wants to put up satellites so that everybody on earth will be in touch with the Internet. Therefore, everybody on earth will be in touch with the Bible because we're loading it up. Digital Bible societies and many, many others are all loading it up with the Word of God, and it's going to be in every, con every single language on earth. Now... We, what, what does that mean? Well, 1776 needs to have it. And so we are finding faster ways so that we can give what we get onto the professionals by going oral to oral. Would you help me just a minute, uh, Martin? Just por uh, por acá, s'il vous plaît. I mean, I, I, I just, yeah, por favor, switch language. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Porque Dios amó al mundo que dio a su hijo unigénito. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Para que todo que cree en él no se pierda sino que tenga vida eterna. Now this is what we're talking about. You see, I think most of you are understanding English. You you act like it anyway. And and so if you have English and you have a Nepalese family here that speaks a a, a language in Nepal that doesn't have a Bible in it, then, and you know, you're, you're, you speak Nepalese, you live there and work there as a missionary for nine years with YWAM, and so you know how to do this, and you know how to find them in Nepalese, and, uh, and uh, Brother Gideon may know how to find it in, in an Indian. Uh, Indian language, and so on. They're here in your, your very living room of society. Thank you. And so you can actually go to them, get the language, as they discover it, and then take that language, hire a guy, he may not even be a Christian, to actually do what we just did. You read the Bible, he translates it in his mother tongue. And as you saw in the fast-moving video, then, then you take it with a checker, and you go back and forth a couple of times, and you can do the whole New Testament. Or start with the Jesus film. It's 80% of the book of Luke. And you can get the Jesus film into their mother tongue. That's the first step. But why do we need more than that? They get to know the Lord. We found not our group, but one of the partnership groups that we work with, went into the Amazon, found there a, a, a language that had never heard. They were unreached, unengaged people group that didn't know anything about God. And they gave them the Jesus film and they then gave their personal testimony, made, it, made them come forward for a pr prayer to Jesus, and came back a year later, 2% said, we are following Jesus. They went to another group. This was not a test. This was their life. They were trying to figure out, how do we do this? And so they went to the other group. They had a recording of the New Testament. And with that recording, it was put into their language. 
And, and so they had that ready to go. It could be done in Houston. Then we take it down to the Indian tribe there in the Amazon. And as a result, you, they have now the Bible in their mother tongue because someone came here. They learned English. Now they listen to English. But you know there's something. If the Bible is in your mother tongue, it has more impact in your life. You notice that? So it's going to be every language, not just every nation, every tribe, every ethnic group, but it's going to be every language around the throne of God, Revelation 7, 9. So the languages are important to God, and he's bringing back together what he divided by language back in the 11th chapter of Genesis. So we, we begin to see all of this happening in our time where it's all coming together. I, I just saw uh, with, the, with the Pope, uh, the man that heads up, uh, uh, what is it, the Facebook. And he was showing him drones that they're going to have powered by solar just circling around every part, remote part of the world where they don't have satellite. Wow, God's moving on people to do something to help us get the job done. That's just delivery. But think about over here, how can you deliver something that hasn't been translated into their language yet and have a drone going around telling them about Nike and Coke and everything, but not about Jesus? So we got to get ahead of this thing. And that's how we do it with language. And so we can do that. And come up here quickly, Dax. And uh, Dax has just returned from the, uh, the uh, where have you come from? Nepal, up in the Himalayas, and you got teams up there, and you're going to all of the homes there, uh, 7 million homes without a Bible. You're giving them Nepalese Bible, but we're going to do more. But right now, uh, what was the longest you, you've been trekking up there, those scary trails like this? And, and what's the longest trek that a team has taken? Uh, we had a team that did a round-trip trek a little over 100 miles. All by foot? All, all by foot. Were they carrying Bibles? Yeah, carrying a lot of Bibles. So they had to have CrossFit before they went. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. We, we, had that, we have that on our base. You'd see them running with 50 pounds on their back. Now, tell us, what, do, what is the impact when they get a Bible in their mother tongue? There's a group, by the way, right up now in Mustang, and that's right on the border with... with uh, Tibet, and they have two languages, Tibetan language and Mustang as well. So you, you see, you begin to see that through immigration, we can do all kinds of things, but if they got some Nepalese languages and actually did the translation here on the weekends, whatever time, or hire the, the people that are involved and so on, and could you make sure that it got into that mother tongue up there? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll take it. Whatever language is finished, we'll commit to take it. And there's 25 bible languages in Nepal right now. And it's on anybiblepovertynow.com. If you look at those, and if anyone speaks those languages, we'll get them those languages. All right. And see, see Dax afterwards. And uh, he, he coordinates our work uh, in, in Bible Poverty Now in Kona. And so... Uh, that's his lovely wife, Rachel, sitting by him. And so as you, you look what God is doing in the world, he's doing every part that fits in what we can do, and he doesn't want to leave us out. Now, why is it so in, important that we get a Bible in every language? There's something that you, we settle, celebrate that David Hamilton mentioned next year, 500 years of the Reformation. What did the Reformation, how did it really start? We call it Protestant, protest. You don't really start a movement by protesting. You, you can start a movement by giving vision, and if, you give, if it has to do with changing lives, you need two parts, well, three parts, to even win a soul to Christ. You need a witness, you need the Word, you need the Holy Spirit. So you do need prayer wrapped around all of that. So as we, we think about starting a movement that will change a nation, how does it happen? 20 languages got the Bible at the same time with the Gutenberg Press to deliver it. But what happened out of that is people started reading the Word of God, 
the Holy Spirit began to anoint it, and then suddenly there was a civilization being born that we all call Western civilization. That came from the Word of God, not a protest, but from the Word of God. You have to have something positive. You can't just be on the uh, defense to win a, uh, any game. You have to go on the offense. Yes, there are defenses. I think it's spiritual warfare. And as we understand what God is doing in the world, you will begin to give a positive vision to the world by giving them the Word of God. Because the Word of God will change. It gave us, at that time, literacy. Because everybody wanted to learn to read for the first time. They, it was in their mother tongue. And that 20 grew to 50. And so, uh, languages. And so, as that started to happen, pe more and more people got engaged in society in different ways, not just fishing or farming. And as you begin to see what happened economically, first of all, they wanted education. Once they got language and literacy, they wanted education. That's why we need the written word by 2033 is when they're planning to finish the last languages on earth with the Bible. But we can get it orally before then because that's the step now that we're, we're moving to. And so when we look at the, the vision of it, look what it did when it brought tremendous education and educational leadership to the West. Secondly, then came science and technology. And that was the fathers of modern science. You see them in Copernicus and Galileo and so on. They were all Jesus-loving, following people who read the Bible. And the Bible inspired them, including the one man they say is the father of modern science, and that's Francis Bacon. And I believe that I am a part of, of his lineage because his name is Bacon and mine's Ham. And so I, that was good enough for me. And so I, I'm sure he's my forefather. Anyway, don't take that from me. That, you know, I got to have a little something here. But uh, when, you, when you recognize what happened with the Industrial Revolution, giving them economic leadership and so on, that's available to every nation on earth. But not just that. That caused the great mission movement. They moved. <clears throat> they moved to a time from one out of 69 by 1900 with a billion people. It was one out of every 27 on earth were believers. This is done by Dr. Ralph Winters and Dr. David Barrett. And so, and then they finished it by 1980. It was one out of every 10 on earth said that they were followers of Jesus. One out of four are cultural Christians. You know, I'm I'm American, so I'm Christian, or I'm Norwegian, I'm a Christian, or Swiss, whatever. But we're talking about people who follow Jesus, one out of ten. And that's coming down. As the people are praying and the prayer movements are going up, God is moving out. So as you begin to see what God can do, look at the movements that our brother was speaking about in his prayer. Look at the, uh, the uh, Jonathan Edward movement. There was Bible in every citizen's home at that time. By 1820, America, by citizens per capita, were the most literate on earth. At that time, there was a Bible in every public school, and it was read every day, and they prayed every day in every school. Now, they had been given by God a constitution that was 34% directly from the Bible. 60% was from indirectly through the writers into the Bible. 94% was really formed out of the concepts of the Word of God. Now that gave us something that we cannot say, oh, we were brilliant and all the rest. It came from God's Word. And when we realize as it's taken away from us, we cannot see the same great awakenings. This is why we got to get out in front with the Bible. And so, under Charles Finney, for example, it was a regional spiritual awakening, the Azusa Street. Why? Because everyone had a Bible in those that it touched. But it didn't touch the Indian tribes of Iroquois or Cherokee, like I've got blood, and Chot. Choctaw, that he's got blood, and, and so on, uh, Apaches and all the rest. But they didn't have the Bible. It didn't touch them. 
Notice, it was like on Mount Carmel, it was the wood that had to be there on the altar with the sacrifice. Then the fire came. And the fire comes in spiritual awakening when the Bible goes out before it. So in 1962, the Bible was taken out of the schools and prayer out of the schools. What entered the schools was violence, was uh, all kinds of addictions, all kinds of shootings, and so on. That fills a society when the society doesn't honor God and his word. But when they honor God and his word, it turns around into peace and prosperity and other blessings that they can actually measure on earth. But it's really that relational uh, issue with God and man as well as horizontal. And so that's with people to people. And so when, when we get God back into his, and his word into our society, we can see the great spiritual awakening. That's why this app, oh, you got to see it. And if you don't understand it, get your grandkids to show you. <laughs> That's the way I get mine. And, uh, and they can show you how to, how to use it. It's one of them. It, you have one, more than one billion ways to look at the Word of God for, for the first time in history because this is the first digital-on-digital digital platform <coughs> with an app like this that has ever taken place. So understand what we're saying here is really powerful. I'm going to give you a free Bible if you'll go to In Bible Poverty, not a free Bible, a free book. When you go to InBiblePovertyNow.com, it's Will You Pray, Be a Part of a Million, and uh, we have others now that are starting. It's not all listed on this area, uh, this site, but th this will help you. And then go to uh, Call Down, a free book. Uh, my latest book is called in Bible, we can in Bible poverty now. And so it has all the steps in it. But one more, I, my wife and I were out in uh, Indonesia. We've been married 106 years, 53 for her and 53 for me. And so uh, we count them all. And uh, right now she's sick or she wouldn't, uh, anyway, she couldn't stay with me this t time. And, and so as we were, uh, in Indonesia in the 60s, mid-60s. And at that time, there'd been quite a move of God on the island of West Timor. And so books have been written about it and so on. And so I went to uh, Octavianus, the head of the Bible school that sent the team out. And uh, that's in Batu. And so I said to Octavianus, I said, tell me what you did differently. Because you've seen our teams before, but you've never seen that explosion. He said, we didn't do anything different. We just did what we always do, pray over them, train them, go. I said, didn't you do Bible distribution ahead? No. There was no word involved in the people's lives? Not that we know. I even talked to Mel Tari, who wrote one of the books. And he, he, I, I said, did you have any Bibles in front of that? He said, no, not that I know of. Well, that always plagued me. A few years later, this was about 1970, I, I was living at that time in Switzerland at our school, and we had a mission, former missionary, a retired missionary, I should say, who was Mr. Germaniti. He was a Swiss. And I said, where were you a missionary? He said, I was a missionary in Indonesia. Oh, I said, were you there in the revival? He, I said, where, where? And he said, West Timor. I said, were you there in the revival? He said, no, I'd already left. I said, well, I've been perplexed. Where was the word of God that the Holy Spirit comes on, just like if I'm winning a soul to the lost, there's word, God's word, there's the Holy Spirit, and there's a witness. And, and where was the, that in the revival? He said, what do you mean no Bible? My wife and I spent 12 years putting a Bible in every home in West Timor, and then God said, leave. And two years later, revival came, and the revivalists had no idea what had happened because they didn't understand the process of the Word of God, the importance of the Word of God going out before us. And so if we can go to the 1776 languages, now we're not just talking about a revival in America. First of all, reviving is reviving the saints. 
And when there's a church in, in revival, then it can move into a spiritual awakening for the sinners that don't even know God, never have known him, and they've never had even time in church or any other place. That can happen in Houston too. But it has to go beyond Houston. What about beyond America? Well, we're only 4.8% of the world's population. We're not all that big. When you get out where I do, and I've gone to every nation on earth, every dependent country on earth, like Greenland is dependent on Denmark and so on. I've gone to all of them, plus another hundred uh, territories and islands. And I, I watch, where did God move? Why did God move here but not there? And how did he have the, they have the Bible but no revival? And I see that all over the world. And I began to see the biblical answer that is so important Whenever the children of Israel, like Ezra, they read the Bible, and then something happens after it. Or in Chronicles, where, where suddenly Shaphan found the book. They lost the Bible, and he found it while they were trying to, you know, take up the money or the offering for the building. And they found the Bible, and then revival comes.